everyone, our, our new um, Human Services Committee. Uh, this is a first time for Mariva Brown and Sarah Rogers and Mark Timmer, who are all a new crew for the Senate Human Services Committee. Sure. And uh, we're very pleased to have all of you um, join us. And so it's, um, it's really a kind of a fun experience to, to um, start out this way. Welcome, Senator Emerson. We still don't have a, a quorum. But anyways, I wanted to welcome everyone to the first hearing in the 2012 the Senate, Senate Human Services Committee. And um, as you all know, uh, we are opening this 2012 year with um, um, an unfortunate situation in our budget, uh, continual budget fight uh, here in California. And um, we will be he having hearings on the cuts on CalWORKs and the Department of Development Services and IHSS that the governor has proposed as we move forward. And um, however, today we, uh, uh, we won't be addressing those issues. We'll be addressing four um, bills that have come before us that were introduced in um, 2011. The first one is um, SB 345, and we have Senator Wolk here um, to talk to us about the Ombudsman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, members. I would like to accept, first of all, all of the amendments that are reflected in the analysis and thank the staff for their uh, efforts with this bill. Uh, 345 will strengthen the state ombudsman's ability to advocate on behalf of long-term care residents' rights, safety, and welfare, and maintain an independent voice at the state level. The state ombudsman is responsible for investigating long-term care resident complaints, protecting the legal right of residents, of residents, advocating for systemic change, and publicizing issues of importance to residents. There is warranted concern that the California State's Ombudsman Program has not been effectively advocating for residents, as evidenced both in the Senate Office of Research Report and the Senate Office of Oversight and Outcomes Report. Both have been provided to you. This bill takes their recommendations and aligns federal and state law and requires the office to develop a report that would evaluate their advocacy efforts and measurable outcomes. The ultimate goal is to ensure that the ombudsman will advocate freely on behalf of facility residents that often have no voice. And with me today is Karen Jones and Kathleen Johnson with the Committee for an Independent State Ombudsman to testify in support and answer any questions you may have. Uh, thank you, and I respectfully ask for your I vote, and thank you again to the staff for uh, working carefully with mine and with the sponsors. Thank you. Um, support, please. Hi, my name is Karen Jones. Thank you for allowing me to be present here today. Um, I wear a lot of hats in the ombudsman world. I've been an ombudsman coordinator or program manager for San Luis Obispo County for about the last 13 years. I'm also the uh, president of the California Long-Term Care Ombudsman Association and a member of the, the Committee for an Independent State Ombudsman. Since the Ombudsman program started in California, there's been a history of repression for the state ombudsman. As recently as 2010, the state ombudsman was not allowed by the administration to take positions on legislation or legislative actions because other state agencies or offices took opposite positions. This includes funding cuts to local ombudsman programs, resulting in dangerous understaffing levels, and the continued over-medicating of care facility residents. For example, in 2010, the current state ombudsman sent an email stating he could not take a support position on AB 2555 because the Department of Public Health had taken an opposed position. Then in September of 2010, another let a letter was sent out to Assemblywoman Yamada stating that the state ombudsman retains the absolute right to decide what, for, what finally should be presented by the office. This shows the unfortunate fact that without SB 345, the ability of the state ombudsman to take positions on legislation can be taken away at any time. This is something we can no longer allow. As a result of this hearing, you may be told that it is too much work to produce a report. I ask you, how can you give away taxpayer dollars without evidence of positive outcomes and a benefit to, the, to those taxpayers? Facility residents are most vulnerable among us. Care facility residents depend on the ombudsman program for so much. SB 345 <coughs> helps to ensure that ombudsman can continue to provide valuable services to those residents. I urge you to support SB 345 and thank you for your time today. Thank you. Others in support? Good afternoon. I'm Kathleen Johnson. I'm a former Ombudsman Program Coordinator and a current ad Executive Director of Advocacy, Inc., an independent nonprofit advocacy agency that operates the Ombudsman Program and the Patients' Rights Advocate Program in Santa Cruz and San Benito Counties. 
For too long, facility residents have not had an independent voice at the state level as required by federal law. As a result, local programs throughout the state work tirelessly to resolve residents' complaints, protect their rights, prevent abuse, and address systemic issues affecting their standard of care and quality of life with little or no support at the state level. SB 345 begins to correct this and other discrepancies by aligning state and federal law. As noted, not until recently was the state ombudsman allowed to speak on behalf of residents. The current state ombudsman has been given permission by the agency and Department of Aging Directors. While this permission is a positive move for the current state ombudsman, without SB 345, the permission can be withdrawn at any time. In addition to legislative efforts, the unfettered advocacy would allow uh, or includes other governmental agencies such as licensing and certification departments responsible for facility re regulatory compliance and quasi-government entities responsible for enacting policies and procedures affecting facility lives. SB 345 will ensure that the state ombudsman actually has a voice in these settings that represents facility residents in issues and policies affecting their welfare and safety and not merely a seat at the table. SB 345, as amended, is the first step toward improving the state office, strengthening local programs, and ensuring that the state ombudsman program is in fact fulfilling its mandated responsibilities to long-term care facility residents. We strongly support this piece of legislation and urge your support as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Before we go on, uh, we have a quorum, so let's establish it. Lou? Here. Lou here. Emerson? Here. Emerson here. Berryhill? Here. Em Berryhill here. Hancock? Here. Hancock here. Strickland? Right? Here. Right here. Yee? Thank you. We have a quorum. I'm sorry. Um, any others uh, in support? Anyone opposed to this? Uh, okay, hang on. We have we have um, support here coming. We have support coming forward. Okay. Good afternoon, Diane Segura, Executive Director for the California Long-Term Care Ombudsman Association. We're the professional organization for all the ombudsmen, whether they are staff or volunteers across the state. Gary Passmore, Congress of California Seniors. We support the bill because we support a uh, strong independent ombudsman. Thanks. Thank you. Go ahead. Any others in support? Senior Senator Lowell Young with the California Senior Legislature in support. Thank you. Okay. Any others in support? Folks opposed to this bill? Good afternoon, Madam Chair and committee members. <clears throat> My name is Joseph Rodriguez. I am the current California State Long-Term Care Ombudsman. I am also the president of the National Association of State Long-Term Care Ombudsman Programs, a position to which my peers elected me two years ago. Let me begin this afternoon by first stating that I am here today to share my position and testify on a bill that suggests that I do not have the ability to take positions or testify on legislation. As the state ombudsman, I take positions on bills independently from the California Department of Aging and the administration. The United States Administration on Aging, our federal oversight agency, has never found my office to be out of compliance with the requirements and mandates of the, of the state ombudsman as found in the Federal Older Americans Act. I want to express my concerns in opposition to SB 345, which is currently amended, would require an additional unworkable overlay to the appointment process for the state and long-term care ombudsman. Existing law already provides for widespread notification of a vacancy and recruitment for the position of state ombudsman. In addition, certain educational standards and experience are required for this position. A bachelor's degree and a minimum of five years professional experience that shall include at least three of the following four areas, gerontology or a related field, the legal system and legislative process, dispute or problem resolution techniques, and organization management and program administration. 
the creation of a hiring panel made up of local representatives of the office would create a conflict of interest and establish an overly bureaucratic process that would be impossible to complete over the short time frame established in law. Other amendments in the bill require my office to reestablish an advisory council for the office, hire outside counsel when the attorney general cannot represent the office, solicit funds, gifts, and contributions to support the operations and programs of the office, develop a report to the legislature that describes an advocacy plan for the office, write a report to the legislature evaluating the previous year's advocacy efforts, and establish an internet website with information about current long-term trends and issues. While many of these activities are good practices, given the limited resources currently available to the office, and without additional new general fund, or in its absence, the redirection of local assistance funds to the state office, I cannot support these amendments at this time. Since 2008, the state office has lost two of our five analyst positions. We simply cannot absorb the additional required workload mandated by this bill without additional resources. It appears to me that the intent of this bill is to ensure the independence of the state ombudsman and the office. I support placing the required mandates and activities of the state ombudsman as found in section 712 of the Older Americans Act into the Welfare and Institutions Code. That action would have no fiscal impact and would certainly clarify any concerns about the state ombudsman's ability to perform his or her federally required activities by repeating these provisions in state law. Thank you for this opportunity to share my concerns and my position, and I welcome any questions you or members of the committee may have at this time. Thank okay. you. Okay, others in opposition? Carol Sewell from the California Commission on Aging. We don't have an official opposed position on this bill, but we have grave concerns about the provisions in the bill that create additional procedures and, and um, processes that will be costly. and put at risk the piece of this bill that does pr protect and ensure the autonomy of the Ombudsman Office. We agree with Mr. Rodriguez that the federal language should be included in full in the California Older, Older Californians Act, and we fully support any efforts to, to add that language um, through amendments that um, would move this forward. Thank you. Okay. Um, any others in opposition? <laughs> Madam Chair, Committee, Daryl Kells representing the California Association of Area Agencies on Aging, which has administrative responsibility over the Ombudsman program locally. First, let me apologize to the Senator for not getting a letter of opposition to her. Uh, I think all of us are trying to catch up since the first year, and, and the bill was uh, just recently amended. Uh, most of my comments, we're going to deal with the panel, but it's my understanding that the author has accepted the committee's uh, suggestions, and we appreciate that. Uh, there are a number of other issues uh, that uh, we're concerned about in the bill. We were not prepared to speak to those today. We were really wanting to focus on the panel. Uh, but if the committee decides to move the bill forward, I would hope that the author agrees uh, to work with us uh, on this bill. Uh, generally speaking, though, I have to say we think that it's, it's not necessary, that most of the things that need to be done uh, with the uh, program can be done administratively. So uh, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Any others in office in, opposed to the bill? Okay. Any comments from members, questions from members? Uh, Senator Emerson? Um, <clears throat> Senator Wolk, I, I, I looked over the issue about uh, the report that comes back to the legislature. I, 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 I find that so cumbersome. I've yet to since in my seven years in the legislature, seen a lot of reports that come back, but we require all these agencies to do these uh, reports. Um, I know when, we're in, when I was in the assembly, we elected to eliminate a lot of these reports because of the extreme cost to, to the state. 
I, 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 I think that if there are questions that come up, we can take care of those during budget subcommittees rather than requiring reports because I think this is an extremely costly uh, proposal and I would um, hope that you might consider eliminating all the reporting situations that come out of these things. Well, I respect um, your request, and I will certainly look at it as we, if uh, you move the bill forward and we can continue to work on this issue. Um, in the amendments that are in front of you, we do combine the language for an ad advocacy plan and the review of activities into a single plan, thereby making this uh, a less burdensome requirement. I don't think it's very burdensome. I think part of the part of what the reports that were done, uh, both by the Senate Office of Outcomes and by the Office of Research, have suggested that um, uh, an advocacy report. Um, uh, uh, an advocacy plan uh, really needs to be part of what happens. And in order to do that, you have to have some retrospective as to what you have done. So I don't see this as a burden. I see this as a necessity to make the office um, effective. Uh, I'm not interested in uh, adding tremendous cost um, to the general fund uh, at all, but I am seeing trying to make this office be more effective, and I'm trying to follow the recommendations of those who were able to really look at this in depth. Well, my, I understand uh, yeah. this is going to appropriations and they'll make the determination on cost, Indeed. but but Indeed. I just find um, I, I've seen very few reports back to the legislature that ever get uh, evaluated or read or whatever, and I think whatever the Ombudsman's office wants to do internally to uh, affect a plan, that's fine. I think that's part of what the operation is, but I just find that this is a, a burdensome regulation that ends up costing us a lot of money. Okay. Any other comments, uh, Senator Hancock? Yeah, I actually have some questions as, as well. Um, let me say I, I'm coming from a slightly different position, but I have to share what my experience has led me to. I, I tend to be skeptical because my experience in local government has not shown me that ombudsman's uh, offices for any subject matter have been particularly useful either to the people making legislation or sometimes to the clients seeking a very vigorous intervention. And um, I am um, interested in that and I, I wondered um, I'm assuming that uh, California is not one of the states that require ombudsmen to, to seek prior approval before testifying to legislators, or are not allowed to initiate contact with state legislators. You are allowed to do both of those things? Yes, that's um, can you tell me um, if you have, in fact, done that? And, ask for changes in state law, or what are the recommended changes that your office has brought forward, and what did the legislature do? Certainly. Um, just last year, we worked closely with Assemblyman Romani on Assembly Bill 313 with Senator Leno in 897, which improved protections for residents of residential care facilities for the elderly. Um, this year, we also, uh, as well as last year, submitted testimony and comments on this bill that you're hearing today, SB 345. Um, there were numerous bills last year on which I spoke at at different hearings throughout the year uh, without prior approval or, or permission. I don't seek permission from mm -hmm. the director or the agency. I have the ability in federal law to exercise that on my own as the state ombudsman. Okay. Okay. Good. So those are those are two instances, and I appreciate that. And you know, I'm just kind of finding out more about what the office does. Um, you must have data on the number of interventions that have mm -hmm. taken place and their outcomes. Are they on your website? They are, Do and they're also they're on our website by by program and on the administration on aging website. Um, in the last fiscal year, for which we have validated data by the administration on aging, the program responded to approximately 45,000 complaints made by or on behalf of residents of long-term care facilities. Of those 45,000 complaints, local ombudsman programs were able to resolve approximately 75% of those complaints to the satisfaction of the resident. Okay. 
Good. So for that, if that activity is taking place, it seems to me that the reports required by this bill should be pretty easy to assemble and, in fact, would make more useful data for the legislature and for committees such as this. In fact, um, because of Senator Emerson's comment that oftentimes we don't see these reports, and I agree, frankly, I would like to have both the advocacy plan and the follow-up report uh, just appear automatically at a time certain on the legislature's agenda because we've all talked about the need to do oversight. Right, right. And one of the things I think it would encourage is taking the 45,000 cases and see if um, you can call out in an advocacy plan what the systemic difficulties appear to be that lead to the cases. So the legislature, without you having to go to a particular legislator or work on a bill that a legislator thought up and, it, you know, and asked for your help on, um, it might really help us uh, – do more effective long-term care planning. Um, and for those reasons, I am going to support the bill. I would move the bill Thank you. Um, as amended Thank you. to appropriations. <laughs> Senator Liu. Okay. No, thank you very much. Uh, Senator Barry Hill. Yeah, this is, uh, this is uh, for Joe, actually, because, uh, Senator, I, I do have some concerns also. This is just very duplicative, and I'm not sure that, that we even need this, given the state's certain uh, financial state right now. So, Joe, the question is kind of to you. Don't you kind of do this stuff already? We currently submit to the administration on aging two reports. Um, one is a part of the National Ombudsman Reporting System, and in that in that report, we submit to the Administration on Aging, which then in turn submits that report to Congress and the President, a summary of all the cases, complaints, and other Ombudsman activities that the program worked on in the previous year. Included in that is a summary of the major long-term care issues that the state Ombudsman program addressed. The Department of Aging also submits a report um, to the Administration on Aging as a part of the National Aging Programs Information System. In that report, um, the state office highlights the major accomplishments to build and protect a system of elder rights. And again, that report is, is mandated by Congress and AOA and is submitted on an annual basis. This, this advocacy plan that's mentioned in the bill um, doesn't go into great detail about what would be included. Um, we're not sure how we would approach that. Would it be a combination of, of local efforts, state office efforts? Um, how would that be collected? How would those activities be identified? Uh, I, I anticipate a significant amount of additional workload that could be as assigned to this bill and to this task uh, in this somewhat duplicative process. And this would directly affect your budget? Oh, point. definitely. We, we simply do not have the resources to assume any other additional activities. We've lost two of our five analytical positions in the office. We've suffered budget, budget cuts as well as other state programs. Without an, an appropriation of new general fund or redirection of local assistance dollars back to the state, we couldn't assume these new responsibilities. Yeah, I'm. Uh, I'm not going to be able to support this <clears throat> bill today, unfortunately, it, just because of the current state of the state and uh, every little extra straw that we put on the back of this budget right now. I think is something that could break the back of, of this budget. So, uh, unfortunately, today I won't be able to be able to support this bill. But uh, wish you the best, Senator. Let me go back to. Um, I guess why we're here. This bill was amended significantly. Um, and uh, can you just, just briefly explain, you know, what it is that you did amend uh, in this bill? Sure, absolutely. Um, and we received the letter of the Ombudsman on January 9th, and I'd like to go through uh, some of that as well. Um, 
the original intention was to remove the ombudsman from uh, the Department of Aging, and that's what's taken the two years here to figure out, because that's not the direction uh, that we're going. Instead, we're taking the results of the two reports, which will, we hope, make a better and more effective office uh, come out of this, uh, following the recommendations of the two um, reports that I mentioned. Um, in response directly to the ombudsman, um, this, this hiring panel issue in the amendments, we're in fact um, accepting uh, that we will delete the hiring panel. So that's no longer an issue, and you heard the other gentleman reflect, um, uh, speak to that. Um, secondly, uh, reestablishing an advisory council for the office. No, we're not reestablishing anything. This has been part of law um, and, in fact, has never been implemented, and the bill establishes a start date uh, so that it will become effective. Um, the, ar the argument number three that has to do with uh, hiring outside counsel when the attorney general can't represent the office. Uh, currently, when there's a legal issue and it affects both uh, the ombudsman and, and DPH, um, you have a problem because uh, <laughs> there's only one attorney general. So the problem is um, uh, who's going to represent uh, if the decision is made to represent the department who represents the ombudsman. So that's been uh, clarified, um, you know, uh, appropriately so. Um, soliciting funds, gifts, and contributions to support the operations and programs of the office, the foundations already exist, and what we're trying to do with this bill is to ask that the members be free from any conflict of interest. That's good government, and that's that was a recommendation. We think that's a, a good one. Um, the, the, the issue of the reports, um, uh, again, we're combining uh, – the, the information is there. Uh, there ought to be an advocacy plan. That's what this um, uh, ombudsman is about. And reviewing the activities which are already uh, available uh, should not be um, – uh, a costly endeavor at all, and I don't. I, again, my intent is not to add costs, but to make this a much more efficient and effective um, ombudsman. Um, the last has to do with uh, changes to the internet website, uh, so that we have some information about long-term trends and issues. We've talked about redoing the website, creating a new website, but. Uh, that's a cost drive issue as well. So if you just you know, update the uh, existing uh, website, which is what um, uh, we're suggesting in this bill, that will be more effective, uh, cost effective. The data is there. It ought to be put in. Um, so uh, those are just some of the responses to um, his concern. I think that the budget issues that he is uh, suggesting uh, we can uh, deal with in appropriations uh, when we get through the um, uh, the the um, uh, the weeds of what you know what exactly we're changing and how much effort uh, that might take. We want this to be an efficient um, ombudsman that um, the local represent the local representatives, the local ombudsman have brought this to us. We have two studies that say we need to fix it up. That's what we're trying to do and from my perspective, at no extraordinary increase to the state. Just let's get it to be working. So I ask for your I vote. That was your closing? That's my close. That's your close. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, the, the bill has been moved. Not, let me just say that um, in response to Senator Berryhill, I, I do um, agree with the author this time. I do, I do know that we are under a, a tremendous budget restraints. Uh, but this is not a new program. This is just something I think that we're trying to build more efficiencies out of and become more effective for our aging population. And, and with that, um, we I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Senator Wright. I'm sorry. I'm Look, let, me, let me ask the ombudsman, who appointed you to your position? I was recommended to my position by the director of the California Department of Aging. The actual appointment came from the governor's office, it's about Governor Gray Davis. Okay, so you've been in the position. I've been here almost 10 years. Okay. Served in three administrations. And I'm going to guess if this bill passes that you would be recommending to this governor that he not sign it? Um, Yes, I'm just. I'm just trying. I mean, I mean, what I'm trying to what I'm trying to get to is that this seems like a lot of effort to go someplace where I would imagine that this governor, since he kept you, would ask you what he, what you thought about this bill, 
He would, and, you, and even if he didn't, I would share my opinion with him. Okay. I mean, that, be, that only becomes a challenge that I have, Senator Wolk. If it'd be one thing if the person in the position was coming to say that this was something that somehow was being precluded by statute, and we were fixing what he wanted to do. But if he's coming to say, I'm going to be the one advising the governor, and I'm going to tell him to veto it, then we're just, I mean, this is kind of sort of a, a suicide mission. And, or this is the policy committee. Oh. Wasn't there a movie about the, the song about you know suicide or something? Painless. Was this? Yeah, painless. Yeah. Mash. Mash. Okay. All right. Would you like a response? Okay. I'm, no, I'm just, that's what I'm saying. I'm, I'm trying to see. There are lots of um, uh, responses that will uh, and lots of uh, advocacy on this issue uh, that will move forward to the governor's office. And we have a ways to go. Okay. I mean, I would, oh. I mean, I'm prepared to I don't believe go, in but, suicide. But, <laughs> but my, only, my only concern would be, it would just seem to me that the, the that we would have a, a, a work product that the incumbent would be in the loop on. So I'm looking at voting on something that the incumbent, I mean, and we're not recommending that we get rid of him. We're just saying <laughs> no. that we're, we're not. We're, no. we're not. The office needs to be improved. Okay. All right. Thank you. Let's call the roll. Lou? Aye. Lou, aye. Emerson? No. Emerson, no. Berryhill? No. Berryhill, no. Hancock? Aye. Hancock, aye. Strickland? Right? Aye. Right, aye. Ye? Okay. Okay. The, uh, it's 5-2, uh, right? 3-2. Uh, 3-2. Three, two. Three, two. Uh, let's keep the roll open for the absent members. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Ms. Wilk. Senator Correa, I thought I saw you. Yes. You have two bills, SB 529 and SB 683. Let's do um, 529 first. That's the seniors. Um, Thank you, Madam Chair and Senators. Uh, yeah. I'd like to begin. You have you have amendments that you are distributing? Yes. Yes. So, um, committee members, there are new, um, this new information for all of you. I've got some for staff. Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. I want to thank your committee staff as well as the chair for your work and assistance with this bill. Uh, November of 2009, the California Community Choices Advisory Committee released a federally funded long-term care financing study called the Home and Community-Based Long-Term Care Recommendations to Improve Access for Californians. The report essentially found that California lacks long-term care strategic plan that sets priorities for services for the future to maximize the use of, of course, finite resources. The goal of this bill is to make long-term care for our state seniors more efficient through appropriate planning and coordination of these services. With the committee amendments we're prepared to accept, and we have, this bill will require the University of California in consultation with the California Commission on Aging and the California Council on Gerontology and Geriatrics and other stakeholders to update the existing strategic plans on aging and long-term care by January 1st, 2014. This bill is proposed to be amended would further require that such a plan included development of a delivery system design plan with a goal of enabling individuals with advanced age or disabilities to remain in their communities and avoid unnecessary institutionalization. I have with me today Senior Senator Mr. Jim Levy and Gary Passmore with the Congress of California Seniors. Great. Thank you. In support. Yes, sir. Thank you. 
Uh, honorable Chair and members of this committee, I am Jim Levy from Anaheim, California, a member of the California Senior Legislature, and I speak strongly in support of Senator Correa's bill, SB 529. California must address the health and social challenges of aging in the 21st century by planning and delivering a continuum of services and assistance with respect to individual choices and providing family support. Development of this continuum, eliminating duplication of effort, enhancing coordination, and setting priorities for resource allocations must not occur without an update in the strategic plan. The California State Plan on Aging rightfully projected the exponential growth of aging in this state. And it stated that by year 2020, we will have 8.9 million seniors over the age of 60. Recent census figures show that as of 2010, there was 4.2 million seniors, 65 ages or older, a 10% increase over the previous decade. And of those individuals, 7, 85 years or older, which it showed there was 600,000 in our state, <coughs> it was up 18% over the previous decade. Due to the significant shortfall in revenue and the state's need to radically reduce uh, its services and frankly had to eliminate certain vital services in IHSS, linkages, adult day health care, MSSP, the ombudsman program and other services such as Meals on Wheels. It has really hurt the situation of seniors uh, tremendously. Uh, and the governor's recent proposal, if it goes through, will really significantly hurt it. 843 million reduction in Medi-Cal and 163 million reduction in IHSS. The California, excuse me. California spends more than a 10 billion annually on long-term care, uh, covering institutional, residential, community, and in-home services for persons of all ages with functional, cognitive, and development disabilities. And we know that California faces enormous challenges, maximizing opportunities for seasons and persons with disabilities of all ages to live independently in a setting of their choice. And the current fiscal problems facing the state and the growing population of older California and persons with disability have enormously magnified these challenges. California does lack an updated plan that would set priorities for services in the future and maximize the use of finite resources. And the California Health and Human Agencies did receive a report almost 300 pages, 299, over a five-year period that was put together, funding long-term care financial study, the home and community-based long-term care recommendations to improve access to California. This report offers 28 recommendations for redesigning California's long-term care service system based on a thorough analysis of long-term term care programs in California and the best practices in all of the other states. At this point, I would really like to urge you to support Senator Correa's bill to make administrative and statute changes, updating the state plan of aging, utilizing recommendations of this five-year report, uh, California Community Choices uh, California Health and Services Agencies Report. Thank you very much for this opportunity to speak. Thank you very much. Madam Chair, members, Gary Passmore with the Congress of California Seniors. I'll be brief. I'd like to make three points. The first one is that the most recent 
plan that this state has reviewed and thought about and talked about came from uh, former assembly member Patty Berg, and it was in 2005, and we had a lot of talk and a lot of enthusiasm, frankly, that was generated around that plan. Uh, the last time I went through that plan and talked to uh, Patty, uh, I would say we probably hadn't adopted 5% of the proposals and the ideas that were reflected in that plan. Many of the ideas are still valid today. Uh, it's time for us to do something and to take another look. Uh, this is a rapidly growing population. Point number two, I think uh, you're all aware or will soon become aware that many of the issues that Mr. Levy described are kind of all of a sudden getting handled in proposals to shift much of our long-term care system into Medi-Cal managed care plans uh, in the larger counties of the state and trying to piece together some system uh, in those 28 counties where we don't have any managed care. This, uh, it, it's frankly being done without any uh, really good understanding of what the implications are for the clients that we're serving with regard to their long-term care services. Given the timeline of this proposal and the timeline of that activity, I think there's an opportunity in here for us to watch what we're doing and try to start figuring out what the real impacts are. My third point is, I guess, maybe my most compelling, and that is we cannot in all honesty say in California today that we have in place a social services safety net for our seniors and people with disabilities. We started losing it four or five years ago, and we've been ripping it apart systematically ever since. And we've got to figure out what the impacts are going to be before we confront a doubling of our older population in California. Senator Correa's bill is a great first step to trying to get our get a grip on where we are and what we need to do. And we support it. Thanks. Thank you very much. Any others in support of the bill? <clears throat> I'm Senior Senator Lily Young with the California Senior Legislature. And of course, we support this bill. I'm also Treasurer of Gray Panthers, and I'm speaking in support for Gray Panthers. Thank you. Thank you. Any others in support? Anyone opposed to the bill? Carol Sewell from the California Commission on Aging. We appreciate Senator Correa's effort to um, look at this issue on the broad scale that this bill would choose. Um, we feel like this has been done, is being done, will be done ad nauseum. Um, and not that that's not important, but we have seen um, SB 910, which was a huge undertaking. Um, the plan was completed in 2003, contained hundreds of recommendations, in, instituted numerous task force and work, work groups who over the years have um, basically lost momentum. Uh, the Commission on Aging was actually charged with monitoring um, on an informal basis. And in our 2007 report on an um, update on that strategic plan, we did indeed discover that nobody was doing the work from the task forces anymore. The change in administration, the budget situation, um, the problem with plans is that they do, they're, they're time, <laughs> time relevant and they go away. Um, there was an excellent plan on long-term care done by the Little Hoover Commission last year that's a part of their sequential work um, that made excellent recommendations for how to change things in this state. There was an enormous effort by a group known as the California Collaborative Step by the SCAN Foundation. There are lots of efforts underway. We, we are in support of finding a way to help California change its long-term care system. I, I'm not convinced that SB 529 is the way to do that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any others opposed to the bill? Comments from members? Senator Emerson. Yeah, I, 
I, I'm, I'm concerned, uh, Mr. Passmore mentioned the fact that in, in 2005, uh, Assemblywoman Berg uh, introduced some, had some recommendations, and we've dealt with less than 5% of them. And uh, here we have an, another report that we haven't acted on, I believe, that's sitting in front of us here. Um, yet the the commission is, is uh, making recommendations to make changes, and I, I, I find this um, um, an expensive way to go about things. Um, I know this is something that will come up in um, appropriations, but there's no there's no direction on how we do the funding for additional um, uh, recommendations uh, to to the legislature on this. And um, I I just have concerns that we're sort of reinventing the wheel with commission other uh, commissions that we have here in the uh, state of California that are set to address those issues. So. At this stage, I, I can't support Mr. Emerson, I think you've made the argument for this bill, which is you've got so many reports out there. It's 2004, then, as the opposition said, a lot of these reports are time relevant. So we keep getting reports and nothing happens, and what we're trying to do here is make sure that something happens. Now, we worked on this bill here in this committee, and we're essentially moving towards updating and making sure we implement some of this stuff. We'll, we'll work on the funding aspect of it when we get to appropriations, but ultimately, as the opposition said, these are time relevant, then they go away. And this is what we have while we continue to have an aging population. I, I hear you, but we didn't even act on the other reports that we did. So, And that's exactly what we need to push forward, sir. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, Senator Berryhill. Yeah. I, uh, you know, originally when I took a look at this bill, I was just going to, uh, my, my question was going to be again, you know, kind of how do we pay for all this stuff? But you've changed it so many different ways from Sunday here that actually, as far as policy-wise, you know, I really don't have a problem with this. I think appropriations deal with, with what it's going to cost and whatnot, but I am going to support it today and, uh, and wish the, the best. Thank you, Mr. Berryhill. Senator Hancock. Um, thank you, Senator Liu. Um, I agree with Senator Berryhill. <laughs> um, I think that with the amendments, so that we're clearly building on the past work that was done, uh, this is really part of the oversight that this committee should be doing anyway in major areas like this. And um, if there's a little Hoover report from last year, that is an example of silos, and I would hope that this group would take that up as a first step. And, um, you know, we're looking at realignment of social services. We're looking at streamlining government in so many ways that we want to do it we want to do it well, and I think this is an appropriate time. My one suggestion as this moves forward to appropriations might be that we move the timeline up. <laughs> um, you know, 2014, 2014 is a while. I would love to have the group do a look at the plan that was done in 2005 in the Little Hoover Commission report and see if there are some things that we really need to be looking at in the context of the budget negotiations that are going to be going on in the next couple of years. So with that, I would move the bill. So to the you. chair, I think Mr. Lee, we have a lot of work to do in the next few days. <laughs> I do. Uh, any other comments from members? Let me just say that, you know, it is a, it is a pile of work. It's SB 910 that was passed in 1999. I don't know whether or not there was anything else that preceded it, uh, dealing with long-term care. And then, of course, you have Patty Berg's master plan on aging and then the Little Hoover Commission last year and currently there's a California collaborative going on all dealing with long-term care. I even had a bill that was sitting over that is sitting currently sitting over appropriations but I do think that there has been lots of recommendations lots of work to do. I do think we need to clear it out and uh, make specific recommendations and move forward with those recommendations and rather just leaving it in some plan parked in some bookcase someplace. It's my understanding that you do plan to seek some private funding uh, for the updated report. Is that That's so? correct. And uh, do we have any, do you have any idea where you're going to do this? Or maybe, uh, maybe I just shouldn't uh, expose somebody else's uh, secrets yet. Those are very secret, those <laughs> gold bars hidden somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> 
But of course, that'll be a, a, be revealed uh, before appropriations. Okay. All right. That's fair. All right. So the bill has been moved by Senator Hancock. So let's call the roll. Do. Aye. Do I? Emerson. Barry Hill. Aye. Barry Hill. I. Hancock. Aye. Hancock. I. Strickland. Right. Aye. Right. I. Ye. Ye. I. Thank you, Mr. Correa. Now you have your second bill, um, SB. Oh, I'm sorry. What was the five? Um, five. Five zero. Is everybody here? I think everyone's here. So your bill is out. Thank okay. you. Thank you. And then you have um, SB 683. Thank you. Yes. That's item three, members. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair and, and Honorable Senators. Um, this bill requires the Secretary of Health and Human Services Agency and the Superintendent of Public Instruction to develop an electronic integrated assessment instrument to consolidate and coordinate multiple agency assessments of special need infants, toddlers, and youth. The goal of the bill is to ease the burden on families and children when multiple assessments are conducted at different times and locations throughout the year. What we're trying to do is essentially eliminate expensive duplication. Funding for the assessment instrument will come completely from private donations. Mr. Emerson? I was just private going to donations. You, if, if you um, reduce your comments, I'm just telling you you have support on both sides, do you? <laughs> How can I resist those persuasive words? <laughs> then if I can. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Joining me to testify in support of the bill today are uh, <laughs> Ms. Joni Anderson of ARC and Ms. Pam Peterson, a concerned mother and a constituent. Okay. Uh, since we have support on both bills, I would ask my, uh, my witnesses to be brief, brief introduce okay. themselves, who they represent. Please. My name is Pam, Pamela Patterson, and I am the founder of the Special Moms of Orange County, as well as a mother of a child um, with disabilities. She is um, a recipient of multiple uh, regional center, California Children's Services, and special education services. And um, I did a spreadsheet um, uh, to prepare for the testimony on this legislation, and um, she was uh, assessed 30 times over the last year. Uh, and of those 30 assessments, I would say that probably four would be the assessments that I was interested in. And of the four, two of them would at least partially be paid for by um, private insurance. So we have a huge redundancy in the system right now and since obviously the budget is a huge issue these children don't get better unless they access treatment and treatment um, getting kids especially kids in wheelchairs weight bearing and um, being able to help with the transfers with the parents it it at least reduces the risk of their being institutionalized. Institutionalization occurs in most cases when the children get older and get bigger, the parents get older and lose the ability to lift the children, and so they can no longer safely care for the children. Institutionalization has an average price tag of $276,000 a year versus $16,000 a year if they're kept in the homes. So. Um, I, this bill will reduce the redundancy in the system and make it a much more efficient and effective system so that these kids can access the treatment that they need. So I urge your vote on this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Tony Anderson, I'm the director of the ARC and United Cerebral Palsy of California. And uh, this is an issue we've heard about for many years, and we urge your support. Thank you. Hi, Madam Chair and members. Uh, my name is Brandon Tartaglia, and I'm representing Disability Rights California. Uh, I'm sorry to come here without relaying our position to uh, you and the rest of the committee beforehand, but this happened kind of quickly. Uh, we did, however, contact Senator Correa's staff, and uh, I talked to Tony this morning. Um, 
the intent of this bill is good. Um, we can see how that getting numerous assessments uh, can be really time consuming and, and downright frustrating. Um, however, we, while we don't have an official opposed position on the bill, uh, we do have several concerns with it, uh, mostly focused around unintended consequences. Uh, for instance, if a parent agrees to be part of this unified assessment tool and gets what they see as a bad assessment, it could cause the denial of many other services since it's, this, it's in the information that all of the assessors see. Uh, there's no way to opt out later without the damage already being done. Um, also, logistically, this could cause several issues. Uh, if all parties are operating on one assessment tool, uh, there could be holdups in receiving any services until all of the assessments are done. Also, getting all of the appropriate experts on the same page at the same time for a single evaluation seems unattainable. Um, even if you could, what would happen if they disagree? Um, we really aren't sure that this, this is a feasible idea with all the different criteria, different best practices, and different program standards all of these experts would be working out under. Uh, the current assessments are different because they're used for different purposes and to qualify for different services. Uh, but like I said, uh, we're willing to work with uh, the senator's staff and the sponsors on this bill. Uh, but all in all, we're not sure if this is a feasible idea in general. No, let's, let's just, it's okay. Um, any other, com uh, any comments from, uh, wait, first, first of all, anyone else in support? Anyone opposed to the bill? Yeah, concerns? Concerns? Well, you can just come and identify yourself and express your concerns, yes. Good afternoon. I'm Kirsten Barlow with the California Mental Health Directors Association. We represent the county mental health departments from around the state. Similar to um, Disability Rights California, we um, submitted a letter really simply with concerns. Um, last year, the senator had a bill, SB 472, that was very similar to this bill. Um, however, in May of last session, it was amended to address concerns from our association as well as CHIAC, um, Health Executives Association, to ensure that in developing this assessment, um, whether it's a two whether it's electronic or not, um, that folks who do the assessments need to be involved in the process of developing the assessment. Um, the new language in this um, version of the bill just simply requires the tool to be um, developed and um, required to be used by all providers who assess children, sort of skipping the process of developing the instrument in the first place. So we've um, requested um, with the staff of the author's office to work with them on some language. I know there is some um, proposed language in the analysis we appreciate the reflection of that in the analysis. I'm sorry, Senator Emerson, you want to say that? Yeah, I, I think uh, the Senator's taken your concerns in, and there's on the latest amendments that addresses that, that issue. You haven't mentioned. seen the yeah. latest amendments. Uh, number three on, on item, if you want to show that to me. Okay. It's page uh, two. The page top, two of uh, the top three. of the page. Let me just add that um, uh, I think I, I, I agree with the idea. It's all about the detail. It's all about all of us getting out of our silos and working together to provide a person with the services they need. And, you know, it's all about all of us working together, not, not just individually trying to pick apart and just deal with your particular issue with this particular child. So, you know, I would encourage, I think the bill is uh, going to be moved forward. It has been, um, and he has accepted the proposed amendment. So, um, and there was a motion by Senator Wright. Oh, okay. Senator Wright, would you uh, propose to accept the bill as amended? Okay. All right. All right. So with that, is there, are there, is there any comment from other comment from members? Concerns? Okay, let's call the roll. Lou? Aye. Lou Aye. Emerson? Aye. Emerson Aye. Berryhill? Aye. Berryhill Aye. Hancock? Aye. Hancock Aye. Strickland? Wright? Aye. Wright Aye. Yee. Yee Aye. 
Thank you, Mr. Correa. Your bill is out. So thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Senators. Okay. All right, and um, our, the last issue for today is SB 764, Steinberg, but I think we have uh, someone representing Dr. Gismara, representing Senator Steinberg. This deals with um, telehealth programs uh, for autistic people, young people. Madam Chair, committee members, thank you for the privilege of presenting uh, this bill on behalf of Senator Steinberg. Senator Steinberg sends his, sends his regards and also expresses his appreciation for the excellent work of your committee staff and is accepted and is uh, uh, pleased to accept the two amendments that were recommended by, by the analysis. Thank you. Um, telehealth is a powerful and important tool that helps overcome major obstacles in providing services to underserved populations. Numerous studies have established that telehealth increases access to care, improves outcomes, reduces cost, and improves pr uh, productivity. Despite these established benefits, telehealth is utilized and less than 10% of California consumers have participated in a telehealth session. SB 764 addresses this problem by promoting the use of technology by regional centers for the treatment of individuals with autism spectrum disorders. Autism, which is the fastest growing serious developmental disability and accounts for two-thirds of all new regional center consumers, is now a major cost driver within the escalating DDS budget. Thus, the use of telehealth would not only improve access but also will serve uh, in constraining the increasing cost for these services. SB 7064 establishes specific guidelines and criteria for the voluntary delivery of telehealth behavioral services by regional center providers. The bill also authorizes regional centers to use uh, this modality in providing requisite parent training. And SB 764 requires that these telehealth services must comply with all existing regulations and also have a benefit for the, either the regional center and or the consumers. Uh, testifying today in support of the bill are Dr. Lisa Breton, Vice President of Clinical Services for Spectrum Schools, Mr. John Shin Lee, who is the Chief Operating Officer for Capital Autism Services, and Dr. Joe Morrow, who is the Founder and President of Applied Behavior Consultants. All of these experts have provided behavioral services for uh, aut uh, autism, uh, individuals with autism and their families for many years. Thank you. In support. My name is Dr. Lisa Britton. I'm the Vice President of Clinical Services and Integrity Assurance for Spectrum Center Schools, where we provide educational services for students with special education and specifically for children with autism. Um, Good afternoon, Chair and Committee members, and I'd like to thank um, Senator Steinberg for his leadership on this issue. Specifically, what I'd like to talk about is telehealth systems and how they can be used to improve the quality of services for children with autism. When I talk about telehealth services, what I'm talking about is being able to use technology for the professional to provide ongoing support for people who are providing <coughs> services for children with autism. This can include using webcams or video video uploads for the professional to review at a later time and provide feedback. This can be encrypted and is all HIPAA compliant. When we're talking about providing services for children with autism, that typically starts with the professional conducting an assessment and developing a treatment plan. Then what happens is that professional provides training and ongoing support to the parents and those who are providing the services. Oftentimes, this is where the program really breaks down when you're talking about services for children in rural areas. The professional is not able to provide the ongoing support that is necessary for the quality of services. And if we can implement this teleservices in, in support for those children who are in rural communities, then we can give those children the level of services that they deserve. Thank you. Thank you. John Shinley with Capital Autism Services. Thank you so much for allowing me to come and present to you today. Um, so as Capital Autism Services, um, as an ABA service provider, um, we see the, te the telehealth as an important addition tool um, and not necessarily just 
to replace your current ABA services, but that it be a supplement tool to current ABA services, um, and and as well as be a standalone program. Um, right now, as it stands right now, the regional center systems do not have a service code for telehealth um, service, and so that service cannot necessarily be rendered through the regional center system. Um, at CAS, we've actually completed two different pilots since 2000, uh, 2005, and one of the biggest drivers that we think right now, the current time, that is really appropriate is the overall cost as far as the internet connections, the equipment. Back in 2005, the cost of an, uh, an equipment was over $25,000 to have only five cameras. But as we all see now, the co overall cost and, and those types of items have significantly decreased. So we think it's a really great opportunity and time um, at, to, to deliver this service. And so we're in support of this bill. Thank you. OK. In support of the bill? Uh, my name is Joe Morrow, and I uh, support what the other speakers said. Uh, we've had a lot of experience with this. We're currently providing these services uh, over Skype for Singapore, cases in Singapore, Portugal, Romania, and Iceland, and it's uh, working quite well. Uh, uh, and, of course, we don't go over there very often, but we do go occasionally. But with the uh, Skype sessions, we're able to provide good services. Interesting. Okay, um, got questions, Senator Emerson? Yeah, I, I was wondering how many tre treatment modalities are there for autistic children? You've listed two here, but are we? Uh, one of the challenges is that autistic services probably fall within about four or five broad categories, but have to be highly individualized. By providing or by having the availability of supplementing these services and these evaluations in a home setting, very often the professionals really are able to provide not only more rapid but more effective assessment by really seeing how, how things are working in the home environment. This, but your question really addresses the whole issue of behavioral health treatment. And for the areas of autism, there are probably Oh, um, half a dozen major categories with various uh, specifications within each of those, like pivotal response therapy, applied behavior analysis, floor time, uh, Denver early start model are, are broad areas. So why, why does this legislation seek to just limit it to, to treatment the applied behavioral analysis and the intensive behavioral intervention? Those are the most expensive and the most challenging forms of treatment with autism. The intent of this bill is to start with where there is the greatest need to get it up and running, and then I would certainly agree to expand it. The concern was that if it was overly expansive, that given the challenges regional centers are facing, it could not be implemented. So it's to really have a very focused program, get it up and running, and then go from there. I'm sorry, I forgot to finish off the uh, in support, and we have someone else who would like to lend their support. Okay. Judy Wallen with the Children's Partnership and Strong Support. Thank you. Brandon Tartaglia with Disability Rights California in support. Thank you. Thank you. Any others in support? Is there anyone opposed to the bill? Anyone concerned about the bill? Yeah, I'm sorry. We have, could you make some room for some opposition here? Madam Chair and members, Bob Jura on behalf of the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees. <clears throat> We're here not to oppose or support the bill, but to express concerns. We recognize the pioneering and ongoing work of both the pro tem and Dr. Vismara in the area of autism <clears throat> and children with autism. We do have an overall concern with the issue of telemedicine and the proliferation of the concept of telemedicine without any recognition for those employees in the various units, both public and private, that provide the services to patients in the various sectors. We have had to date 
what I would characterize as very productive conversations with the pro tem staff at his request. It is not the pro tem's intent to replace existing workers in both um, public and private <coughs> health care <coughs> services with, um, um, with telehealth uh, as an overall concept, but we, with the loss of jobs, the closure of um, developmental centers, and, um, and other aspects of health care uh, job loss, we would like to express our ongoing concern and our hope that this is not the beginning of a proliferation of, of this type of legislation. And we will continue to work with the pro tem and his staff. Thank you. Hi, Doug Chiapetta on behalf of uh, AFSCME Local 206, the Union of American Physicians and Dentists. Uh, I'm just going to pick up where Bob left off. We, we have comparable concerns. We are not uh, in a position to take an op opposing view today or a supportive view, but we want to echo a few concerns. One, uh, as you know, there's been a trimming down of developmental centers throughout the state, and consequently that has impacted our uh, psychiatrists and for AFSCME Local 2620, their psychologists. So one initial concern would be that the uh, vendors that do work with the regional centers, would there be an opportunity for civil servants, psychiatrists, or psychologists to perform some of this work because they are being removed from some of their positions in mass throughout the state? Secondly, it's unclear from the bill as to whether or not uh, telehealth would preclude uh, an opportunity for face-to-face -face, uh, with uh, autism uh, patients, and, and that's just this concern from a medical perspective. But, you know, uh, by and large, it's a good bill. Uh, it has great merits, and we look forward to working with the pro tem moving forward and to, uh, just ironing out some of these concerns. So thank we thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other opposition? Um, any questions or comments from members? Um, <laughs> Senator Hancock. Again, thank you. Um, thank you, Senator Liu. Um, I actually, I, I believe, I don't know if you finished your line of questioning before, Senator Emerson. No, I, just, but, I didn't have a comment about it. Okay. Well, I thought it raised an issue, frankly, that would be of concern to me. Maybe. I mean, because this is a new area to me, and I've been trying to figure, figure it out. Um, I'm concerned about the quality of service, and it scares me to take any televised system, whether it's an educational system or a health system, and start on the process of eliminating face-to-face -face contact and talking about um, that you can do it just as well on a television set or a Skype or whatever. And Skype has technological difficulties, everybody. I don't care. <laughs> it does. Um, I've tried to have phone conversations with it. Um, so I'm concerned about that. Um, and, you know, I thought that the one of the witnesses did say something about home visitation for diagnosis in terms of which of the four or five kinds of autism we're talking about and what the best interaction is. So... Um, you know, I, I can see a limited role if you're, we're in a situation where literally the experts are not available, that you try to get some supplemental services brought in um, electronically. But a, the sense that, um, but then the bill should say something like if expertise is not available personally or something. Um, I, I just, and I, I, don't want to see us setting a trend that would lead to this expanding and being used in ways that would that would make personal contact less available to people. May I address your questions, yeah. which I think are very excellent and very perceptive. First of all, this would be a voluntary program. It would have to have demonstrated benefit to regional center and or consumers. Uh, Experts are actually finding that the use of telehealth, which is widely established in a broad array of other medical specialties. I mean, this is not an, telehealth is not an experimental service. It's established it, in- Is it a service or- It's is, a is this a, gen, is, is this in a generic way of talking about services that are electronically rendered or is telehealth a brand name of some sort? No, it's a generic service okay. that That's how we refer to it. That uses technology to enhance and supplement and improve 
face-to-face -face interactions. I don't believe there is any specialty in healthcare that is using as technology as a way to replace the human interaction, but it's really a way to make the human interaction more effective, more appropriate, and more efficient. And there are numerous studies which I would be delighted to share with you and your staff, Senator, that have clearly established that these modalities are of incredible value for behavioral services, for psychiatric services, and for mental health services. And this is just merely an application on a voluntary basis for, uh, for regional center services, which are really facing tremendous cost pressure. Uh, it's not to replace workers. Uh, it's strictly voluntary. The population that would re be receiving uh, these behavioral services is at a very young age. This is not a population that is existing or currently resides in developmental centers. Uh, researchers at the Mind Institute have actually compared the efficacy and the satisfaction and the outcomes using telehealth and telemedicine versus face-to-face center-based services, and the outcomes appear to be to be comparable, to be just as effective. Parents actually like this a lot better. The satisfaction from a parental perspective using using technology as a supplement was felt to be very highly. So I would be glad, I think the questions you ask are very, very appropriate. Those have been considered, and I believe that this bill is a way to move forward in a very judicious and in a very appropriate manner. You know, I, I appreciate that, and I actually would be interested in the executive summaries of some of the reports. I'll provide them today. You know, um, I just think it might be useful if there was clarification as the bill and moves Dr. forward Morrow, that we're talking who, supplemental. Who actually, oh, okay. okay. If you'd like, uh, well, Skype did. <laughs> oh well, I don't want to argue about Skype, but uh, you know. Um, <laughs> It's just that, you know, it does uh, have time delays and it does break up and go, well, I don't want to discuss it anyway, a particular product. I, we're, talking oh. about, we're talking about electronically delivered right. health care, and I can see for consultation, for supplemental, for maybe some training of super experts for other people, um, but I, I'm... When, when I see things like diagnosis and treatment, this is, this it feels like that by, could be a by the UC Medical Center in a broad array of, of health care, and I would be glad to provide okay. you that information. Okay. I think whenever technology is introduced into a field, there is always a potential that you'll have fewer people. I mean, I mean, in hospitals today. Um, you might go in and have a procedure done. That procedure is placed online and is emailed to someone who makes a diagnosis at home. They may then email back, say, a hospital or a clinic and email a pharmacy with a prescription, and the professional never saw the individual in person. That is, that is a very common occurrence in, in places now, and in some instances, that professional might see three or four times more people than he would have seen had he made had he had to make a personal visit. I mean, I, I, I'm aware of some instances where a single radiologist is doing diagnosis from 10 different facilities, from one facility, without ever having to travel to those facilities because he's getting an email that contains all of the diagnos diagnostic material. So he didn't have to drive to those 10 clinics. He or she stayed in one place, made the diagnosis, was able to email back what the treatment was going to be. Now, the, you could make an argument that had that technology not been there, you would have needed three or four additional radiologists. And so someone could say, well, this caused radiology jobs. It could, that becomes a risk. I mean, I think, I don't know that we should fear the technology, and I think here I would have to defer to the professionals in the field to determine whether or not the standard of care 
was being compromised by the technology. I'm, I'm not qualified to make that decision, and so, I mean, we'll have to, to rely on you. Because <coughs> my concern that was raised by the other folk would be, if the standard of care was being reduced in the name of technology, then that's a poor use of the technology. If the standard were being maintained, but the care was being expanded, then I think that that becomes a good use. And I think here, I'll, I mean, your doctors who do this, I'd have to refer to them. You made another mention, and I'm, and I'm, I'm curious here, of the expanded uh, condition of autism. Is that a function of the diagnosis getting better, or is it a function that there's something causing more children to become autistic? Experts would suggest that it's both. There's no doubt that uh, over the past 20, uh, 20 years, uh, people are much more aware of it, uh, uh, and there are better diagnostic tools. But the experts believe that a combination of genetic vulnerability in some populations and environmental factors probably accounts for a significant proportion of the, uh, of the uh, increased population that we've seen. Uh, to put it in a personal perspective, if I can indulge the committee, our, our son was diagnosed, who's now 18, 15 years ago, uh, with he was diagnosed with, with severe autism at the age of 18 months. At that time, there were 4,700 individuals with autism in the regional center service, in the regional center system. That number is now over 53,000. So it's been a pretty pretty tremendous increase over I mean, but the past. There's, there's a third option. A diagnosis would be one, some expansion of the disease. A third one would be that we are now classifying things as autism that heretofore were not. Mm -hmm. There have been some studies that have looked at that, and there may be a small number, but it, it, it probably is misclassification. And again, the mind has done some studies, and there have been other studies. It doesn't appear to be a, a, a huge number, but that's a very good point, Senator. And, and I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm, no, I'm, I'm clearly asking because I'm seeing things that now refer to this. Yeah. You know, much more often than used to be the case. Senator Steinberg, again, with this bill, really feels that the use of technology, I mean, when we, we again, and I would just reemphasize that technology is being used tremendously throughout a broad array of various health care. It's being used in cardiology and gastroenterology. It is being used in radiology. Uh, it's being used in dermatology, uh, in psychiatry, psychology, etc. In this particular instance, uh, the intent of this bill is to, number one, use technology to improve information about developmental disabilities, both for providers and parents uh, and consumers, and second of all, to actually improve the efficacy of those face-to-face -face interactions so that by using technology, information can be gathered in a more natural environment, there can be better oversight of the uh, providers. Uh, we do not feel that this will impact uh, the number of, of workers since it basically limits this application to people who are already vendorized to the regional center. So we look at this as a better way of expanding services, particularly to underserved populations. Okay. Okay. Um, Senator Emerson and then Senator Yee. Yeah, I, I think there's been a little um, misunderstanding. There, there, there are um, commercial telehealth uh, 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 applications out there where people can go and get health information. Uh, yours is a different uh, model here. This is a uh, where a professional is actually evaluating a patient and, and, and doing doing the, 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 the treatment uh, through those. Uh, and and I, I, I mean, we have uh, people who are actually doing surgery that may be thousands of miles away from a patient today. So technology has taken some rather uh, large um, uh, strides in, in, in tr treating uh, patients' health care. Uh, I, I, I like the direction this bill is going. What I don't like, um, and I, I've got some problems with the fact that you're limiting to two uh, situations in this bill, and I think the more choices that uh, health care providers have to make that diagnosis and, and provide that treatment is a better thing. So. Um, I can't support it as it is. I, li I like it, uh, but I think you need to expand all that. I, I would be delighted uh, to try to do that, Senator. Uh, the, uh, the concern that Senator Steinberg and, and would, would have would, would, would be uh, whether regional centers could uh, uh, 
uh, could implement, perhaps. Uh, it's, it's not just going to be regional centers that are doing this. I mean, this is going to be a lot of other. Uh, this is strictly for regional centers, sir. This bill is very, I, I, I mean. Yeah, but the, 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 pro, the professionals are not going to just be within the regional center, right? Uh, n no, this bill is very narrowly focused for, for regional center providers. And I think that's another safeguard is the people who are making the determinations about using the technology are people who are providing those services right here and now. So they're going to have the discretion to make the determination whether the technology is going to be a benefit to the consumers in the regional centers. They're going to have the fiduciary responsibility then to provide that oversight to say, yes, this is a better way of doing it. This bill is very narrowly focused, uh, Senator, for regional centers. It's a vendor, though. It's not the regional center. It's a vendor who probably is outside of the regional center who's providing the service. But and, he's then, I'm sorry. Yeah, but he's a vendor. I mean, I, I see that as a big difference, though. I, I would love to work with your staff in, in f figuring out ways to expand it, sir. Senator Yee. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, let, me, let me just understand um, what this bill is going to do. It's going to require that the Department of Developmental Services establish a telehealth system of programs for the purpose of what uh, diagnosis and treatment of autism. We've actually, uh, per the committee's uh, staff's recommendation, that will be deleted. That the, the program requirement will will be deleted as as an amendment. So uh, we didn't want to make that any impose any undue burden of establishing a new program. So that has been deleted per staff recommendations. And then in its place now, this program or this bill will then authorize um, regional centers to be able to diagnose autism via a tele. Uh, communication type technology? Not diagnosed, but it will authorize them to use telehealth for parent education and training, which is currently required. It will also authorize them on a voluntary basis to provide treatment, behavioral intervention treatment via telehealth. This does not address diagnostic considerations. So, so, so you will not have professionals uh, using uh, some electronic means to uh, uh, to test and assess an individual for a diagnostic category. Correct. Okay. It's and, strictly to provide intervention. An intervention. And so you would have um, an individual a professional of some sort uh, uh, using this particular technology to work with other professionals or parents about how to treat certain conditions and behaviors relative to autistic youngsters? Exactly right. And those are the same individuals who are currently vendorized to have contracts with the regional centers. So they're the ones who are just providing services. It would enable individuals, as have testified today, that if they in the regional centers feel that their technology can provide existing services in a more effective and beneficial manner, it would provide the infrastructure and the reimbursement codes to authorize that on a voluntary basis. And, 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 and what, what, what is the um, uh, uh, mechanism to ensure quality assurance that, that using this technology, how do you somehow evaluate that, in fact, uh, youngsters are receiving the best of care? Again, through this, exactly the same mechanisms that are in place right now, through audits, through individual personal plans, uh, through audits from DDS, to, through uh, oversight through DDS. It, the exact, the same case managers, the same quality control assessment tools that are in place now will 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 provide oversight for this uh, methodology. What you know? Let's just uh, say that uh, I'm a parent. I'm a kid who is autistic. I receive vendor services, and in those vendor services, they're face-to-face -face contact. Right. And then we switch over to a technology base. And I then, in my review of the individual plan progress, say that, well, I don't think this is really working. Not so much the technique, right. uh, but rather the lack of face-to-face -face interaction. 
So how do we get over that argument and say, all right, well, let's go back then to these kinds of face-to-face -face contacts? Very simple. You contact your case manager at the regional center and you say, I want a new IP, uh, uh, individual uh, plan. I want a new IPP, which is the equivalent of an IEP for the but regional the problem, center. But, but the problem is that the system now is kind of used to you know, using this particular technology. And I think that, you know, you and I know that the reason why you have these technologies is the, the issue of cost and convenience and this and that. So, so there is an inherent reason for the regional centers and others to use this particular technology and going back to something that may be a little bit more expensive but may be a little bit more effective, you know, there's going to be some resistance. So how, how do you address that issue? I, I, let me just isn't this isn't this acceptance of telehealth a voluntary absolutely um it's a voluntary thing the parents don't have to um, accept this this treatment if they, I mean, this way of methodology so, so in that particular case then if i then switch over voluntarily switch over and i don't want it anymore can I then unilaterally say I don't want it anymore? Absolutely. I mean, that that's whole. Uh, first of all, the treatment but, but, about. But going to that IPP meeting presupposed that, you know, you're going to get the regional center to sign off on that. Because every time you go to these IPP meetings, you don't get whatever you want. It, it's whatever the regional center ultimately says, you know, we agree with you and, and so on. As a parent who's participated in numerous, you know, the treatment for autism, as I'm sure you're aware of, sir, is, is one of constant change and flux. The, the services that a child receives when they're two years old are much different when they're six, eight, or ten. Uh, if, and, and there have been innumerable, there are a lot of examples where a certain treatment for autism is tried. And if it doesn't work, you try something else, just like certain forms of behavioral therapy may work for kids. I don't believe that establishing, you know, the type of technology that we're talking about, I don't believe it's either cumbersome or so ingrained or so inculcated that it would be a barrier to remove if it's not appropriate or effective. Again, studies have, have, have demonstrated that it's, it's pretty simple to implement uh, given the availability of technology. I think it's going to imp improve access for a tremendous number of individuals in underserved populations. And if it's not working for individuals, just take the laptop away. I mean, I, you, know, I, you know, I agree with you. I mean, that's how it should work. But, you know, being involved in this particular area for a long, long time, you know how difficult it is to change and to uh, modify, right, absolutely. you know, IPP, IEPs, you name it, because there is a, and there, there's a, there's a vested interest once you adopt it, and, and it's but hard. I, I mean, parents have so many, you know, difficulties. But the safeguards for this bill, sir, is first of all, it has a very limited focus. That's why we decided to focus on autism and, and a, a certain form of therapy. Number two, it has to have a demonstrated benefit to the consumer or the regional centers. Number three, it's a voluntary, it's, it's, it's a, a voluntary approach. And I think the best safeguard is that if it's not working for the regional center or for the consumers, it ain't going to be used. I think, um, I think I'm going to request that perhaps that word voluntary needs to be better clarified in the bill. <laughs> At least, I mean, I, I would, you know, it was, as the bill moves forward, I would, Absolutely. would hope that you would uh, consider that. And I think, Mr. Do you have more questions or comments? Uh, Senator I, I, Yee. Okay. Oh, I, I think a couple of things. Uh, how many vendors provide this service currently? I mean, how many? How many? How many? I mean, is there a limited number of vendors? Or uh, Dr. Morrow tells me that there are hundreds in, in what in Northern in California. California. Yeah, that's that's where we are, right? Oh, I'm just checking. I, I, <laughs> It might be Kansas. <laughs> so, so in California, so it's not like we're providing a a kind of uh, of directive that would benefit a limited number of vendors. So we, it's, a, it's kind of an open yeah. pool, and the uh, the expense, such as it is, again. So in addition to the, the benefit, would in part be uh, the expense to the regional center. So that as they're defining the benefit, it would be the expense, the service. So it wouldn't be a simple limitation as to how you define the benefit. Correct. 
Yeah, I mean, transportation cost is one thing that comes immediately to mind that would be of. There, there would be the, the, and the um, modalities that you're picking are probably some of the more expensive. So this almost represents a pilot. So in time, you would expand the service as you, as the take rate and the kind of uh, uh, results that you were getting. It is a pilot, you, exactly. Okay, right. I'm just saying. That might be, again, the voluntary nature of the program, the pilot aspect that you're starting with two modalities, albeit the more expensive of the, the treatments, but you're doing a pilot on two that you hope to expand as you make better progress and, and people become. There are numerous vendors. I think those probably need to be amplified because it would, it would help people Un you. understand that it's not something that is a limited number of vendors that people are going to be denied the opportunity to see the physician if they wanted to. Okay, I'm, I, I got it. I'm, I'm ready to go. I could move the bill with, at the appropriate time. Okay. Uh, Ms. Hancock. Yeah, just to say, I appreciate all the clarification <laughs> that we have gotten because I, I think this is an important issue for many of us. And so voluntary pilot, I noticed in both the letters of support and some one of the studies that I was just handed, it's, it talks about areas with limited access and it talks about parental acceptance and coaching, some of the issues Senator Yee raised, um, to the extent that that can be clarified in the bill so that maybe we can come back in a year or whatever also and find out what the results are. Um, um, that would be helpful. We'll be sure to give you a laundry list as you move forward. Senator would, Emerson. Uh, those are great suggestions. Thank you all. <laughs> yeah, it's a pilot project, but there's no definition of the pilot when it ends, where it is, or anything. So what, what, what is it? Uh, again, what I would. programs have an ending date? We would be glad to take those amendments as it moves forward. I, and I think if we're talking about a pilot program, we should have that in there. Yeah. So thank you. Okay. Yeah. okay. okay. Any, any other comment? Uh, uh, Senator Yee? I, you know, I, I, I'm going to be supportive. You know, I, I spoke with um, Senator Leo's staff that, that for at least for me, you know, I do have concern about what it means to be a pilot. You know, it, it's fine to let someone in, but if it doesn't work for a kid or a parent, they ought to then be allowed to get out of the uh, 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 pilot or the uh, experiment and get back the services that they used to have. And, and I, I think that for me, that's extremely important because, uh, you know, we can always kind of help parents understand that, gee, this is a better technology, better service for your kid. But and they'll try it. But if it doesn't work for them, they ought not to be penalized and said, "I'm sorry, you're stuck with this." And, and those are great suggestions, and I'd love to work with uh, committee staff in, in implementing those as amendments. You know, at, at the present time. Okay. All right. Um, the bill has been moved. Um, let's call the roll. No other comments. Let's call the roll. Lou. Aye. Lou. Aye. Emerson. Berryhill, Hancock, aye. Hancock, I, Strickland, Wright, aye. Wright, I, Yee, Yee, I. Four zero. Yes. Okay, the bill is out. Thank you for the excellent and very constructive uh, comments. Greatly appreciate it. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Uh, for members who um, need to add on, let's. Um, Call the roll on uh, number one, SB 345, for those absent members. Strickland? No. Yee. Uh, Matt, Madam Chair, you know, I know you're in the midst of the roll call, but let me just mention I spoke to your staff. I, I think I still have some angst about, uh, you know, how some of the uh, comments of the Ombudsman Director, uh, some of the concerns that he has relative to this bill and that I don't want to place undue burden on that, and I understand that we will be, or your staff will be communicating with that director to work out some of those uh, issues. And with that, I'm ready to support you. Thank you. So it's an aye. Aye. Yeah, aye. And we have, so that is? Four, two. 
four two. The bill is out. Um, Senator Correa's bill, uh, SB five twenty nine. Results are five zero. Five zero. The bill is out. S B um, item three. S B six eighty three. Six Correa. zero. Six zero. That bill is out. And we just had the um, item four with Senator S um, B seven sixty four with Senator four Steinberg. Zero. So I send four zero. Yes. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Meeting is adjourned. Thank you very much. <coughs>